Hello and welcome to Sunday Worship from Hersham Baptist Church. My name's Phil, I'm the pastor of the church here. We're here to bring you good Christian resources to help us all to be courageous in mission, Bible saturated, spirit dependent and loving of others. If you are new here, then you are very welcome. Please hit like and subscribe below to stay in contact. I'm going to pray and then we're going to read the Bible together. Let's pray. Almighty God, whose spirit fills the world, present in all places, filling all things, we pray that you would fill us today, that you would meet with us, that you would change us, that you would hold us, that you would renew us, and that as we speak and listen and go into the world, you would change us to be Jesus to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're taking a break from our regular series to read and to think about the story of Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And so today I'm going to be looking at Palm Sunday and thinking about what it means for us. Every week I like to give a lunchtime summary to say what we've been thinking about. And here's today's. Jesus is king and that's good news. Jesus is king and that's good news. Jesus is king and that's good news. To put it a little bit longer, Jesus came to bring peace and hope and life. To receive it, we need to accept him as king and follow him. Jesus came to bring peace and hope and life. To receive it, we need to accept him as king and follow him. Well, we're going to read the story of the first Palm Sunday together uh, with the passages from the Old Testament have predicted it. So I've got my Bible. Why not grab yours? You can pause the video and go and grab one. And let's read together. The first reading is going to be from Psalm 118 and verses 25 through to 27. Psalm 118 and verses 25 to 27. Lord, save us. Or Hosanna. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his love endures forever. Then we're going to read from uh, the prophet Zechariah, so skip on, about 300 pages. Zechariah is one of the short books at the end of the Old Testament. And we're going to read from Zechariah in chapter 9, and verses 9 to 10. This is a prediction that was given several hundred years before Jesus about a king who would come to Israel and come to Jerusalem and bring peace and deliverance for the people. Let's read. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea. And from the river, that is the river Euphrates, to the ends of the earth. And then finally, we're going to read our, our main text for the day, which is Matthew 21. If you want to keep your Bibles open in Matthew 21, then really encourage you to do so. Page 988, if you're in a New Testament uh, in the NIV. So Matthew 21, I'm reading from verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt beside her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfil what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their coats on them for Jesus to sit on. 
A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of God. So you have this story of Jesus and his followers are approaching Jerusalem. They're coming up to the city where the great feast of Passover is going to be celebrated. And I want you to imagine there are millions of people that come in from all around the country, from the north and the south and the east and the west. It's as if uh, people have come down the, the A1 from Newcastle and, and down the M11 from Cambridge and, and from Liverpool and Manchester. And it all converged on uh, the city of London, I suppose a bit like a cup final going on with people coming from all over the country. And the big story, the only thing that anybody's talking about is that there is this man coming. And he's a, he's a prophet who, who they've heard about from the north. Are coming down towards Jerusalem at the moment when the, when the children of Israel, when the people of Israel gather together to celebrate the time they were delivered from a great enemy. I suppose a, a, an analogy in our, in our culture would be VE Day or perhaps Remembrance Day where, where you remember the time when, when the nation faced uh, great peril at the hands of other people and was delivered mightily because of it. And so Jesus is coming into the city with his followers and his friends and the people look at him and they start to do things that indicate they see him in a particular way. And Jesus doesn't stop them. He actually plays along with it. So he goes and he tells them to go and get him some donkeys. Now he's not doing this by accident. We, we know that he knows what he's doing because of verse 4 and 5 of chapter 21 of Matthew. Says this was done to fulfill what was said through the prophet. It's not actually easy to tell whether it's Jesus who said that to his disciples. Or his disciples who knew what he was doing. But either way... He's doing something designed to teach a certain thing. He's acting out a kind of parable as he approaches the city. One way, I suppose, of thinking about this in a modern British context would be as if Jesus had said, I want you to go down to the nearest Rolls Royce showroom and I want you to get a Rolls Royce Phantom out and take back the roof and I'm going to stand outside acknowledging the crowds like this as I come through. He gets on this donkey and it's colt that speaks to the people that they know is the way that the king who's going to deliver Jerusalem will come into the capital city. And he climbs on this and starts to ride towards the city. And as he's going, I don't know if you can imagine it in your mind, but he's passing crowds after crowds after crowds. And there's a noise spreads through the crowd and a ripple here and a ripple there. And people start to rip the trees apart. They're literally climbing up the trees, ripping branches off, branches off, branches off and throwing them on the ground. Why? Because a king should have a red carpet. So they're laying down, they're taking their coats off, they're throwing them on the floor. I suppose if you can imagine the, the A1 or the M11 or the M25 and the M1 as they come into London and Jesus is approaching, this man is approaching and they're covering the roads with garments and with, with carpeting and with trees and with leaves because they say, hallelujah, the king is coming. And they, the, 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 as, the, as the procession gets towards the city, the excitement builds and builds and builds. And you can imagine now there will be news helicopters coming in and a ticker tape going along the bottom. Who is this? What on earth is going on? And the people say, it's Jesus. And they start to shout out this chant. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a kind of ancient equivalent of shouting out, long live the king, God save the king, God save the king. And he travels down the road and he comes into Jerusalem and it's the most extraordinary scene. And it's a famous story, a really famous story. And I want to draw out three things that we can learn from it. See, it's a multi-layered story. There's loads we could learn, but I want to draw out three particular things. The first is that Jesus is king. The first is that Jesus is king. The second is that for some, 
That's actually bad news. Jesus is king, but that can be bad news. And yet for us, if we're willing to live with him as king, it can be the best news you've ever heard. So first, I want to think about this idea that Jesus is king. Everything in this story, as I started to talk about a moment ago, is designed by Jesus and by Matthew as he retells it to communicate the idea that Jesus is king. Jesus picks what he's going to do really carefully. It's not an accident that as he comes to Jerusalem, he picks this idea of riding in on a donkey. He didn't get there and think, I'm too tired to walk in anymore. I've been walking all day. I need to uh, ride a donkey in to save my legs. He's deliberately reenacting a promise and a prophecy, a prediction that was made several hundred years before about what the true king of Israel would do. That's that that prophecy, that prediction we read from Zechariah in chapter 9. That the king of Israel would come and that he would ride on a donkey because he would be coming to bring peace. He would be coming to declare an end to battle, to to free the people, to, to declare God's true rule over them. So Jesus is deliberately reenacting this prediction. And what's more, he actually uh, says it to his disciples. And certainly they understand it. Verses four and five. In the original language, it's not easy to understand whether it's Jesus who's speaking and saying, actually, this is what I'm doing. Or whether it's the disciples who just go, it's obvious what he's doing. But either way, everyone understands that this is the point. And true enough, the people respond by creating a kind of red carpet of tree branches and of coats for the king to ride into Jerusalem on. And again, they're not doing it randomly. If you read through the scriptures that came before this and the stories of ancient Israel, this is what the people did. When there was a tyrant in the, who'd taken over the city and a bad king who needed to be defeated and a new king arose to take them on, this is what the people would do. They would rip down the branches of the trees, they would lay their cloaks out and they would welcome the new king in. And they start to sing and they start to declare, you're the king, God save the king, Hosanna to the son of David. They start to sing the songs about the king who would deliver them. You know, they're singing the national anthem. God save our gracious king, the people declare. So I want to think about what it is for Jesus to be king. Why is it that Jesus himself and Matthew and the crowds make such a big deal about this? Indeed, everything that happens after this moment, all the way through to Easter Sunday, is really about this question, is Jesus king or not? It actually climaxes with Pilate uh, nailing a sign above Jesus's cross, spoiler alert, saying here is the king of the Jews. Everything that happens between now and Easter is about whether this man is the true king. And again, super spoiler alert, when he's raised to life on Easter Sunday, we find out that he was all along. So what does it mean for Jesus to be king? Well, I wanna suggest there are two things about being a king that are really important to understand. First, Kings tell people what's right and what's wrong, what they can't do and what they must do. They govern, in other words. And we don't like to think about that particularly. We live in a society and in an age that's very suspicious of authority. But ultimately, kings and governments are responsible for saying what we must do and what we mustn't do. If you struggle with that idea, then think back to a few weeks ago. The whole country was crying out for a government who would tell us what we must do and what we mustn't do because we faced a threat. There needed to be someone who ruled, who could assess what was good for us and what was necessary for society and was allowed to speak authoritatively about what we must do and what we mustn't do. Kings govern. The second thing that kings do is that kings defend. They defeat a society's enemies. They're there to deliver the society from its biggest threats. Again, you might struggle with that idea now. We live in a very pacifistic age, and and in some ways that's really great. But actually there have been times in our history and in the history of the world where a king or a government has been necessary to stand up and say no. 
I am going to lead, we are going to lead our people in fighting against a threat that will destroy us. The most obvious example from our recent history is World War II. And so you have these two qualities of kingship, that the king governs and the king defends. And actually these two qualities are bound up with how the crowd reacts to Jesus and what will play out over Holy Week. And so I, wanna, I want to focus on them at the moment because actually the way that you respond to these two aspects of Jesus as king determines whether it's good news or bad news. See, the way that we respond to the idea that Jesus has the right to govern and the right to defend determines whether this is the best news we've ever heard or whether it's bad news. For some of those in the crowd, it was the best news they've ever heard. They turned the, the world upside down. They became saints and martyrs. They founded the church. They raised the sick. They, uh, they preached good news to those who were captives. They did battle with philosophers. They changed the world. For some it turned out to be bad news and they would have Jesus executed a week later. I'm going to spend some time now thinking about what makes it good or bad news and how we can tell where we lie on that spectrum. So what is it that makes Jesus as king bad news for some people? Well, if we're stuck in pride or in self-will, if we desire power or priority, then the idea that Jesus is king will be bad news for us. Let's think about those two aspects of being a king. You see, if Jesus has the right to rule, then we don't. If Jesus has the right to be the one who says this is right and that's wrong, this is how you should live and this is how you shouldn't live. You need to forgive your enemies. You need to uh, make peace with those who are at war with you. You need to show love to everyone, regardless of their race or creed or colour. You need to be someone who is seeking reconciliation between people. You need to be faithful in your marriage. If Jesus has the right to say these things, then he's the one who's determining how we live and not us. And that could be hugely painful for our pride. See, we like to be people who are in charge. All of the rest of Matthew's gospel, up until the point where Jesus is uh, arrested and tried, is pretty much taken up with this question. Who's in charge? Jesus has debate after debate with people who say, you're not the king of me. You're not the ruler of me. I'm in charge, not you. And so he goes into the temple and he sees people trading and selling and making money off the prayers of pilgrims who've come from all around the world to, to pray in the temple. And he says, this is wrong. You shouldn't be profiting off the desperation and prayers of these people. And so he overturns the money tables and drives the animals out of the temple. And the people, the people in charge say, who are you? Who are you to tell me what to do? He welcomes tax collectors and sinners. He says, I can offer you forgiveness. If you turn your life around, if you say sorry to God, you stop what you're doing, you sin no more, then you will be forgiven and you will be accepted back at my table. And the people in charge and the people in authority say, who are you to say what's right and what's wrong? Who are you to say who's forgiven and who's not? Who are you to tell me what to do? Until eventually Jesus is tried and he's executed and Pilate, the Roman governor, sticks a sign above his, uh, his cross saying, this is the king of the Jews. And the rulers of the people say, take it down. He's not the boss of us. You see, if we are proud and self-sufficient, then Jesus as king is bad news. Let's think about this other aspect of being king. Why is it bad news that Jesus takes on our enemies and defeats them? Surely that's good news. Well, yeah, it is. Absolutely. But let's stop for a minute and think what we mean when we say we want our enemies defeated. I think sometimes what we mean is we want people we don't like defeated. We don't stop to think what's the true enemy of humanity. What is it that destroys our souls and our lives? What we think is, I don't like them, I want God to take on them. I don't want Jesus as king, I want a divine attack dog. And so there were people who were following Jesus and they were zealots. They wanted him to overthrow the Romans, to drive them out. The Romans were the big bad of, 
uh, the year naught in uh, the year 30 AD in Israel. In the same way that the Nazis were the big bad in the 1940s in Britain and Europe. And they were bad. They did awful things. They took over, they subjugated nations, they, they extended their empire across the world, they were despotic, they did a lot of good as well, but they did awful things to the indigenous people. They were bad. And the people said, we want you to defeat them. They're the real problem. And we want you to help us. We're the real goodies. They're the real baddies. We're the real goodies. We want you to make us healthy. We want you to make us wealthy. We want you to defeat the people we don't like. Now, it's easy to cast stones at them, but surely we do the same thing, don't we? Aren't there times when we think, if only Jesus would defeat my enemies, if only I'd never got sick, if only he would get rid of the bully at school, if only he would get rid of the boss I don't like in my office, if only, if only, if only, if only he would deal with terrorists, if only he would deal with uh, the, the mums at the school gate who say unkind words, if only he would deal with my husband or my wife, if only he would deliver me from my enemies, if only he would put them down and pick me up. That's the kind of king I, king I could get on board with. And when Jesus comes, he doesn't come to deal with those enemies. He comes to deal with the real enemies, the real problem that humanity as a whole faces, which is sin and suffering and death. He's not interested in driving out the Romans. He's interested in saving the Romans, just like he's interested in saving the Jews and the Britons and anyone else. So if you're looking for a strong man to lead you and defeat the enemies and drive them out of your land and offer you health and wealth and prosperity, Jesus as king is terrible. Because he comes and says, no, I'm going to suffer and die because you need forgiveness. Because I need forgiveness. Bad news is if we're looking for someone who pro promise us wealth or health or prosperity and the defeat of those we oppose, is that Jesus isn't going to do that. If we're after an easy life or power or vengeance or riches, Jesus isn't going to give them. This king will conquer not through killing, but through dying. And he'll call his followers to do the same. So if we're stuck in pride or self-will, if we desire power or priority, then Jesus as king is really bad news. And so they killed him. Then why might Jesus as king be good news? For all who will receive it, having Jesus as king is not only good news, it is life-changing. It's not even worth comparing with any other news. You see, when I say it's good news, it sounds a little bit like I'm saying, oh, I had a card today. I had a card from my auntie Gladys and she's feeling a little bit better from her cold. Oh, and by the way, Jesus is king. And they're both good news. This isn't good news like that. This is life-changing, epoch-revealing, moment life uh, millennium-defining, world-changing news. This is the news that revolutionised the entire world. This is the news that has changed the, the world to the point where one-third of the world's population is already a follower of Jesus, and that percentage is going to grow and grow and grow. According to every sociological study, Jesus' kingdom just keeps advancing. It's really good news. Why is it good news? Well, let's think about those two aspects of being a king. First of all, Jesus rules. Hallelujah. Jesus rules, and that's amazing. Why? Because I make a mess of my life. Because I am lousy at saying what's right and what's wrong, what must be done and what must not be done. I'm terrible at it. And what's worse is that I'm a fool as well. I tend to kid myself. I'm doing a great job. No matter how many people I hurt, no matter how depressed I become, no matter how entrapped by things and by bitterness and by relationship breakdown, no matter how many wars we start, no matter how many times we fail as a society, no matter how many people are oppressed, we keep on saying, well, don't worry, it'll be different next time. If only we had another shot at being in charge, at being in control, then it would be different this time. And you get conservatives who say, oh, we're going to look back to a, a day in the past when it was better then. And we need to go back to doing that. And you get progressives who say, well, it's never been better. And if only we were in charge, it would never get worse again. And no one's right. All we're doing is perpetuating the same problem, which is that the wrong people are in charge and the wrong people is us. 
And here is Jesus and his teaching is wonderful and it knows us. Jesus designed us. He loves us. He knows how we should work. And he's given this teaching, which if we followed it would change us and change the world. Jesus is Jesus being in control. Jesus teaching. Jesus saying what's right and what's wrong is great news. What a society it would be in if people never took revenge. What a society we would live in if people forgave their enemies, if people were compassionate upon the poor, if people were willing to live lives giving themselves for others rather than seeking to take for themselves. Jesus as king is great news if we're willing to be humble and accepted. Jesus knows what will satisfy our souls. You see, it's not just good for a society, it's good for me. When I live my life as a follower of Jesus, when I do what he wants, my life is better because of it. It isn't easier. Lord knows it's not easier. But it is better. I am happier. I am more satisfied. I am healthier in my mind and in my soul, in my relationships. When I live the way that he says, than the way that I say. Why? Because he knows what he's doing. He designed me and I didn't. You know, we can be a bit like a kind of stubborn man. I'm sorry to all the men watching, but men tend to be more like this than the others. Refusing to read the manual and insisting that we know how to operate the machinery and constantly getting it wrong and yet refusing to read what the maker said it should be like. And here you have a man who comes and says, I know how you should live because I designed you and I love you and I want you to be used the right way. Jesus as king is good news. As Jesus said, his words give life. We can stubbornly cling to the right to choose our own ethics and way of life, to the right to take revenge, to pride and self-determination, and we can live in the misery and selfishness and self-centeredness that human beings inevitably collapse in towards. I could call 6,000 years of history to my aid. Or we can turn and say, no, I want to follow the man whose teaching has led the world in the single biggest advance in human flourishing and ethics it has ever seen. Jesus as king is good news. And second, what about this this enemy thing? Well, Jesus has defeated our greatest enemy, which is sin and death. My enemy isn't the Romans. My enemy isn't the person I dislike. Even if I got rid of them, one day I'm still going to die and I'm going to carry the burden of guilt when I do. I'm sorry to be brutal, but that's the truth. Our greatest enemies are not our competitors, our political opponents, our rivals, or even nations that are at war with us. Our greatest enemies are sin and death. Sin cuts us off from God and from each other. It breaks our relationships, it corrodes our souls, it leads to nothing but bitterness and sadness. Death extinguishes life. I need a king who's not going to defeat the Romans, I need a king who's going to defeat the grave. Jesus is the king who's broken the power of both sin and death. When he bore our sin to the cross, he destroyed it and its power. Because of what Jesus did at Easter, we can be forgiven. To use a contemporary analogy, sin is like a virus that infects our bodies and our souls. It destroys our societies and ultimately leads our lives. And Jesus went all the way to the grave to gain a vaccine. And he'll offer it to anyone who's willing to accept it. When Jesus died, he purchased forgiveness of all. When he rose from dead, he demonstrated what the crowds had said was true. If the great question of the end of Matthew is, who is king? When God raised Jesus from the dead, he said, he is. He is. As king, Jesus doesn't promise us victory over our human enemies. He doesn't promise us health or wealth or prosperity. I'm sorry if you're waiting for them. What he offers is much more and much better than that. He offers us forgiveness and healing for our souls and life. Jesus as king is good news. So what should this mean for us? Well, Jesus is king of all things. In some ways, whether you accept this or not, it's true. Certain things are true, whether we like them or not. There are plenty of people who don't like the fact that Boris Johnson is prime minister. He still is, whether you like it or not. I'm sorry. Jesus is king, whether we like it or not. He is sovereign. He reigns. We know because God raised him from the dead, showing his power and authority over everything. And if we want this to be good news for us, then we need to do three things. First of all, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, then you are hugely welcome. We love you. We want you to keep watching these videos, keep reading your Bible, keep praying and seeking out Jesus. 
But God's word to you today is repent. Be willing to give up being the ruler of your life and accept a new king. Be baptised and you'll be accepted into Jesus' family. And his spirit, his life, will come into you and begin to change you and teach you and give you hope and joy. For those who are followers of Jesus, for those who are Christians, I want to suggest that this means that we ought to allow Jesus to speak into our life as king. We don't want to be like the members of the crowd who shouted out hallelujah on the Sunday and then on the Monday when he challenged the way they lived, said we don't want you. And we can do that. We can say, well, I want Jesus, but I'm not going to let him rule. Practically, that means bringing our lives to him in prayer, praying regularly. It means thinking about his teaching by reading the Bible. And it means ultimately letting it correct us. How can you do this practically? Well, I've spoken before about having a journal where we give thanks for five things each day that we're thankful for. I want to suggest you add a second question underneath that. What is the one thing I'm sorry for today? And we practice that daily process of repentance, of bringing our lives to Jesus and saying, I want you to rule and not me. And third, we can rejoice in what he's done. Give thanks, worship, sing hallelujah, not just on the Sunday when he walks in, when the crowds are doing it, but throughout the week. Give thanks, worship and remember what Jesus has done for you. This is a time of difficulty when people feel sad and afraid and often alone. Worship, give thanks, remember the reality that Jesus is king. Jesus comes to bring peace and hope and life. To receive it, we have to accept him as king and follow him. Jesus is king. And that's great news. We're going to have some more sung worship now, so I'd ask you to stay tuned with us. If you'd like prayer for anything, please do get in contact through any of the links in the show notes below. Mm-hmm.